Uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to the Green Party U.S. Annual National Meeting 2021. Uh, this session is entitled Controlling the Menace of High-Tech Weapons. Um, our presenters today are Heiko Vanis and Ryan Swan. They are members of the Green Party Peace Action Committee. They have shared interest in exploring international conflict issues and advocating peace-promoting initiatives particularly the restraint of arms racing and the strengthening of international laws limiting arms conflict. Ryan will be a doctoral candidate and researcher in Germany in the fall. Hike is a retired IT consultant currently serving as the secretary of GPAX. Their presentation addresses the dangers arising from a new generation of weaponry that threatens world peace by increasing the dangers of mental war and uncontrolled escalation. These weapons may also become powerful tools of oppression if allowed to proliferate in the absence of appropriate arms control measures. The Green Party is uniquely positioned to be a leading voice in opposing the reckless pursuit of these new weapons. The presentation will include two pauses for Q&A and the speakers have asked that questions be submitted via the Zoom chat facility. Uh, thank you all for attending and the floor is yours, Ryan. Thank you so much, Lou. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the introduction. Appreciate the opportunity to present here at the Green Party annual meeting. And I also want to welcome those of you in attendance. And thank you for being here and say that we look forward to interacting with you in the two Q&A periods. Hike, could you please advance the slide? So we have a lot of material to get through today. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through my portion before I hand off to Hike. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background history of arms racing, the lead up to the present high-tech arms race. Hike will then take you through this pressingly dangerous development and the weapons systems that are in play. I will then talk about the problem and how we might go about addressing it. Next slide, please. So diving right into the material here, uh, in terms of the pre-industrial era, the main point to note here is that force has been a major ordering principle throughout the history of human societies. And the uh, leader's inclination to uh, pursue, to use force and to pursue superior force for achieving desired ends has been a constant throughout human history. And this remained through the, through the, the nation state uh, and through the Napoleonic Wars. Next slide, please. So as the Industrial Revolution took place, this had marked implications for weapons technologies, um, nitrogen-based high explosives, machine gun technology, chemical warfare, etc., and also in auxiliary capabilities, rapid allowing for uh, comparatively rapid troop transportation and greatly facilitating military strategic communications. Uh, in the late 19th century and into the 20th century, the lead up to World War I, uh, new capability, powerful new capabilities were developed, particularly the dreadnought battleship and new aerial and submarine capabilities. And these were, employed to devastating effect in the, the two world wars. Next slide, please. So that takes us up to phase one of what I call the, the modern arms race period. That is the end of World War II and the advent of the nuclear era. Here in the United States, first successfully tested nuclear weapons in July of 1945, the famous Trinity test. This is the site of which is featured in the, the photo there. And once the, these weapons were then of course used twice in, in Japan the next month in August. And once the war ended, there was a brief, albeit half-hearted effort to place nuclear weapons under international control. That was the Baruch Plan, also sometimes called the Atchison Lilienthal Plan. That failed. The Soviet Union went on to successfully test nuclear weapons in 1945 and game on from there. The nuclear arms race was on. 
uh, first in the original uh, purely fission-based weapons like were used at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and then quickly into new generation nuclear weapons or thermonuclear new, thermo weapons, which were considerably more devastating in their impact, much higher yield. Next slide, please. So again, the Soviet Union lagged behind a little bit, but successfully acquired hydrogen weapons or thermonuclear weapons in around 1955. And then the arms race shift, the nuclear arms race shifted from a warhead development to delivery vehicle development. And this is where the uh, MIRV, the multiple independently targetable reentry vehicle technology came into play again with the United States in the lead, but Soviet Union catching up. And once it did in the mid 19, mid to late 1950s, the prospect of omnicide or destruction of the virtual destruction, if not entire destruction of the planet became omnicide, became a realistic prospect. Next slide, please. So this raised what I call the first credibility problem or credibility problem round one. And in order to understand this, we need to briefly understand deterrence theory, which has been the governing doctrine essentially throughout the, the nuclear period and uh, up to the present. And deterrence theory is essentially cr premised upon the ability to make credible threats. But once both sides developed, incredibly destructive or acquired incredibly destructive thermonuclear weapons with the ability to deliver them by means of MIRVed missiles. The prospect of omnicide was in play and this undermined the ability to make credible threats. It became difficult to credibly threaten to destroy the entire planet if the Russians came into or the Soviets came into East Berlin, for instance. So those quote unquote brilliant minds in the in the mainstream think tank community in, in government think tank community um, went about trying to resolve this problem. Rand Corporation was instrumental, uh, Thomas Schelling was instrumental, and Albert Holstetter ultimately developed the idea of the tailored response, which was essentially to threaten make lower level threats using um, sub nuclear weapons capabilities. Next slide, please. So this ushered in phase two, which is where the arms race essentially transitioned from nuclear weapons capabilities or predominant focus on nuclear weapons capabilities to a massive investment in developing advanced conventional weapons with the idea being that, okay, nuclear war can't be fought, but we can still fight and win conventional wars with advanced conventional weapons. Kennedy administration introduced the flexible response strategy, which was essentially implemented Albert Holstetter's policy. And the United States did very successfully develop advanced conventional precision guided weapons, which were used to great effect or demonstrated to great effect in the, in the first Gulf War. Here, this photo features uh, me standing next to some precision guided weapons at the military museum in Belgrade, Serbia, which were used in the, in the Balkan Wars as well. Next slide, please. So as these weapons became more and more sophisticated, more and more destructive, or more and more able to hold high value targets, adversary high value targets at risk earlier and earlier in conflict scenarios, and as Russia and China caught up, which they did with um, hypersonic missile capabilities and so on, the credibility problem round two reemerges. And this is where um, essentially it became more and more difficult to threaten the use of these advanced conventional weapons because they effectively undermined escalation management and the um, prospect of wars quickly escalating up to the, to the nuclear level. So this is where Haig and I suggest that war in the traditional sense effectively ceases to be 
wageable. You can't fight nuclear wars, and now with advanced conventional weapons and all the players possessing them, we can't really fight conventional wars in the traditional sense anymore either. So what do we do? Next slide. Instead of pursuing alternative paths, the same leaders that led us down the, the nuclear and conventional arms race path are now leading us down the high-tech path at the, if we can't fight traditional wars in the traditional battlefield, we've moved into the high-tech gray zone. And here to walk you through this, I will hand off to Hike. Thanks, Ryan. I'm going to uh, uh, embark on kind of an impossible mission, which is to describe uh, uh, a number of complex uh, weapons categories. But I'd like to start with a short uh, history lesson Man in the uh, black and white photo here is Hiram Maxson, a uh, New England born inventor who made his fortune by um, designing and patenting and selling the first belt fed machine gun, a highly destructive weapon. It was uh, deadly, reliable, capable of a uh, sustained rate of fire for almost as long as you could feed ammunition into it. And uh, this weapon was uh, sold widely to all the major armies of Europe and became um, uh, a potent component of their arsenals. 30 years after its invention, it was put to use with uh, deadly and somewhat surprising results. The uh, casualties in World War I were horrific. They were largely caused by uh, artillery and machine gun fire. In the Battle of the Somme, the most destructive battle of World War I, 300,000 soldiers were killed or went missing over several months. Remarkably, 20,000 British soldiers were killed on the first day of the uh, Allied offensive. And uh, the, the best and the brightest military minds who led their nations into World War I expected a brief and decisive war. It was long and bloody with unprecedented levels of uh, uh, killed and wounded military personnel. And what's important to note here is that the military doctrine right through until the last year of the war didn't really change. It was an article of faith among the high commands of uh, both sides that a well-led infantry assault would succeed. Well, they were well-led and they failed consistently the battle lines didn't shift more than uh, a few dozen miles from the entire course of the war at a horrendous human cost. And this is a key point because new weaponry does not introduce appropriate doctrinal changes. Military doctrine and political uh, strategy lag the arrival of new weapons. And this is relevant to the rest of what I'm going to present because we are faced with a panoply of radically new weapons now. And the danger is that political and military leadership won't comprehend the, the consequences. So I'm going to discuss three groups of uh, uh, new high-tech weapons. And I've shown this Venn diagram here to uh, make note of the fact that they're not sure they're not sharply distinguished. They have uh, overlaps because they're all computerized and they're all software enabled. But uh, there is a rough functional distinction and I will go through each of these three categories. They also present uh, ethical challenges. They are all shrouded in secrecy in terms of their development and uh, deployment. Uh, there's no effective international regulation of these emerging weapon systems. And politicians, the military, and vendors all have powerful incentives to back these programs. So it is a, a dangerous mixture of technology and, uh, and negligence, I would say. And with that, I'll get into the categories. So let's talk about space weapons first. They're perhaps the easiest to grasp. Everyone has been exposed to them notionally in science fiction. The reality is quite some distance from uh, 
the space combat of Star Wars. But basically, functionally, these are weapons that can attack targets in space, mainly Earth orbit, or they can attack targets on Earth from space. And the threat is that uh, a lot of military capability is in orbit, warning systems and communication systems that are crucial to the command and control of nuclear uh, arsenals are all in orbit. The US has uh, spent a lot of uh, money on putting uh, launch detection satellites in orbit so that we know when a missile's been launched against the United States. Also, the far-flung uh, nuclear assets of the US are coordinated by communication satellites. So an accidental or deliberate attack on these military satellites could precipitate a, a launch on warning scenario where a nuclear war starts simply because of some satellites being knocked out. The other threat is uh, a resource concern because putting things in space, weapon systems or not, is very expensive. And then uh, lastly, incidentally, if you start breaking up satellites in orbital space, there's a danger of cascading destruction as the debris rips its way through other satellites in the same uh, region of orbital space. If you haven't already seen the excellent film Gravity, I suggest you do, because not only is it a superb uh, feminist uh, drama, but it shows uh, with striking computer effect what this type of chain reaction destruction of, uh, of satellites would look like. So let's start with the uh, timeline for the space arms race. Uh, if you're around my age, you remember uh, this, the, uh, the early space race, Sputnik alarmed US uh, military and uh, uh, government authorities because the Russians had beaten us to space. It was a very tiny satellite that just sent out a radio beacon signal. But the US immediately cranked up uh, support for all aspects of uh, science and technology. And a year later, it launched its own primitive satellite. But uh, the Pentagon and US industry began racing ahead with plans to use orbital space for surveillance, communications, and perhaps other uh, purposes. So the early uh, spy satellites uh, were put into orbit, initially using photographic film uh, retrieved in capsules parachuted back to Earth, but eventually purely electronic transmitting high resolution images. And then a family of communication satellites came into play. In a sense, this was stabilizing because the, the nuclear command and control earlier was subject to radio interference from uh, long distance radio communication. So you had the possibility of uncoordinated uh, decision making. As uh, orbital space became militarized, responsible parties uh, became alarmed because the next step might be orbiting nuclear weapons, which would create an extremely dangerous um, threat regime because you could deorbit one in a matter of minutes with no, no early warning. And uh, the potential for accidents was also already uh, becoming apparent. So there was a successful step toward uh, uh, arms control here. And, Nuclear weapons were banned and still are, but uh, nothing much else was banned from uh, uh, orbital military use. So in the 70s, you had uh, all the parties developing uh, early warning satellites, the major powers, and uh, things really began to come apart with the Reagan administration and uh, with Bush, the elder, abrogating the ABM treaty. There was a lot of theoretical talk about having missile interceptors in orbit until they figured out it was uh, way too costly, but there is lingering interest in that. Um, the US getting out in front of this type of uh, program alarmed the other major powers, so they began doing corresponding research. 
And that brings us up to today where we are back looking at space as a new warfighting domain. The US Space Force has been established expressly for the purpose of uh, conducting operations in orbit, defensive, offensive, what have you. And of course, all that is shrouded in secrecy and we don't know its extent. Let's talk about the escalation danger first. I mentioned that uh, attacking the satellites is extremely destabilizing. And uh, I think uh, I don't really need to say more about that. Uh, countries are aggressively developing and testing anti-satellite weapons. We really need some kind of uh, treaty prohibiting that because it's uh, uh, a dangerous threshold to cross. There are many ways for a satellite to destroy another satellite. Uh, microwaves, uh, kinetic strike, uh, lasers, and I'm sure all of these are being pursued in various R&D organizations among the major powers. The weapons that have been tested so far uh, have been ground-based interceptors and uh, two alleged attempts by uh, orbital vehicles to at least inspect and possibly intercept uh, other satellites. But the rapid development of powerful laser and directed energy weapons threatens another um, unstabilizing development here, which would be an Earth-based anti-satellite uh, directed energy weapon, which uh, could be quite effective in disabling a number of satellites in a short time. So uh, the last piece of this is sort of miniature space shuttles that the US and other nations are developing. They are robotic uh, orbital uh, trucks, basically, that can carry any sort of uh, military cargo into orbit. And you can be sure that some of those cargoes might be anti-satellite weapons. Uh, Russia and China are developing similar spacecraft. So just to recap, uh, you have the possibility of ground to space weapons, space to ground weapons. We've been um, tearing up a lot of treaties lately. If we decide to tear up the ban on nuclear weapons, the US could have orbital uh, thermonuclear weapons up there and space to space, missile interceptors, anti-satellite weapons. The only thing here prohibited at the moment is the orbital nuclear weapons. The costs here could be uh, literally astronomical. Right now, it costs $1,000 to put a pound uh, in Earth orbit. And this is just the launch cost. The R&D of these exquisitely complex devices, uh, you can only guess how many billions could be spent in uh, lofting all of this high-tech gear. And then there are the ground control facilities. Uh, all these systems need to be uh, managed and monitored. And satellites have a fixed lifetime, so there's a replacement, long-term replacement cost to sustain these uh, orbitable, uh, orbital weapons, battle stations, whatever you want to call them. Then there's competitive pacing, our old friend, the arms race. If the Russians have a, uh, a counter satellite, we need a counter counter satellite, and then they need a counter 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 satellite. Where does it end? And of course, the US defense establishment has not distinguished itself by coming in on time and under budget for major programs. So we can expect that to continue. So from a um, civil benefit point of view, uh, there's nothing good about pursuing space weapons. It's a massive diversion um, of national resources away from uh, prudent expenditures. So if you haven't guessed by now, the arms control is a challenge. Can we prevent this type of conflict escalation? Can we restrain arms racing in, in space weapons? How can we even verify that these things aren't being developed and, and deployed if it, they're all top secret programs? Chapter two, what are autonomous weapons? <clears throat> 
this is a sci-fi picture of a robotic army from one of the um, Star Wars movies. The, uh, the amount of battery energy density you need to have a true robotic soldier is decades away. So you're not going to see robots carrying guns marching around. But many other weapon systems that are capable of becoming autonomous at some point are under development. These images are of uh, systems that are either on the verge of deployment or in advanced testing. And uh, it's not internationally representative. I have one uh, Russian robotic armored vehicle here. The Navy has something called Sea Hunter that can track down and destroy submarines independently. That's not operational, but it could be within months or years. The Air Force is, uh, moving full steam ahead or uh, at uh, uh, mock speed ahead uh, with something they call Skyborg, which is a super intelligent maneuvering combat aircraft. And uh, our newly minted Space Force, of course, has the X-37, first of many orbital vehicles. The Chinese have similar programs underway. Again, they're all top secret. We don't really know. but uh, you don't really need a horoscope to figure out all, that all this is, is coming, and none of it is uh, regulated by any kind of arms control. This picture on the left is a robotic armed patrol vehicle um, at the Gaza fence. Israel has deployed these to prevent infiltration at the, the Gaza fence. There's a clearer image on the right. Uh, an Israeli arms company, ELTA, has produced this combat robot. Uh, Hiram Maxim would be happy to see that there's a machine gun as its armament. Uh, there's an electro-optical sensor, which I think at this stage allows remote operators to see through the eyes of the robot and command it to fire on uh, intruders, potentially. And uh, it's important to realize that once you build a robot, its autonomy is really just a function of the capabilities of its computers and software. So you have a nascent autonomous platform and the ability of an observer to determine how smart or how in independent this device is, is non-existent. You only know when it uh, behaves in a particular uh, manner. And maybe even not even that, can you tell if someone is pulling the trigger remotely or if the robot has made that decision on its own? It is obvious to all observers the next evolutionary step will be full autonomy. Autonomous weapons have many, many advantages uh, in uh, military competition. They don't have human frailties. They don't get tired. They don't panic. They don't get disoriented. They don't feel fear or rage. They don't overreact, they don't underreact. Subject to their programming, they follow precisely their instructions. They don't have biological limits. They don't need bathroom breaks or food or water. Uh, recharge probably is all they really need and maybe resupply with ammunition. And that means there's a much thinner logistical train behind them. You don't have to provide um, all of the uh, sustaining elements that uh, uh, manpower requires in the field. And the, the training issue goes away. Uh, they improve their skills steadily. They, it just takes a few minutes of downloading software and they're fully up for, uh, for combat. They also open up entirely new capabilities like swarm attacks where there's a cloud of, uh, of robots that act in concert and that can uh, uh, deploy very sophisticated uh, group tactics. Uh, they can uh, be part of a hybrid force where uh, part of the uh, ensemble is human and they're augmented by AIs or even led by AIs. And you have machine learning where a sufficiently sophisticated uh, robotic system can actually uh, learn new tactics and, uh, and adapt dynamically to a changing battlefield situation. So these Advantages are very appealing to military leaders and uh, uh, promise 
uh, supremacy in some future battle. But of course, if everyone is pursuing the same technologies, we are in the kind of feudal arms race that uh, uh, we've seen too often. So just to sum up the threats, uh, escalation, if you've got AIs that aren't properly uh, regulated or managed, uh, you, they can climb right up the escalation ladder before you know what's happening, especially if the uh, robot intelligence is doing higher level decision making as to what forces to engage. There's a possibility of harm to non-combatants if the uh, robotic weapons act indiscriminately, if they can't distinguish or won't distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. The picture in the center is the uh, monument to the My Lai massacre uh, that was erected in Vietnam. Not too many Americans visit that, I imagine. And then the potentially unlimited expenditure on a, a AI robotic arms race. We already discussed the escalation risks. There are the possibility of unknown interactions because this is all new technology. Software very often isn't fully tested. And when you have uh, unpredictable software from, from uh, adversary entities colliding, the results could be quite surprising and uh, uh, undesired. And ultimately, the possibility of doomsday machines, if you put the entire chain of uh, weaponry under the control of AI decision making, then uh, we're back to the omnicide scenario. Uh, I need to emphasize that there is an evolutionary dynamic that wants to push human decision making out of the uh, future battlefield. Uh, and I'll start that by showing this chart of what's called the kill chain, which uh, is used by uh, the military for remotely piloted drones, typically. And uh, the steps are pretty easy, almost self-explanatory. You have to locate a target, precisely determine its position, keep tracking it, uh, lock on a weapon system, and then crucially decide to engage, which is basically the decision to destroy or kill. Right now, that's done by some officer, depending on how low the discretion is. Uh, it might start with a kill list in the Pentagon of targets that are to be destroyed if they're found, or it might be done situationally, uh, ambiguously, some officer uh, we'll make that decision. But is it going to stay that way? Not likely. Uh, there's a powerful theory in military strategy developed by uh, Colonel John Boyd a few decades ago. Uh, and it's a very broad and insightful concept of uh, how advantage uh, can be achieved in a conflict situation and extends all the way from two boxers in the ring to the clash of uh, uh, two armies in the battlefield. And it's really based on how quickly uh, a combatant can go through the stages of uh, recognizing the nature of the situation, deciding what to do, and then acting on that decision. This is called the OODA loop for observe, orient, decide, and act. And pilots in air to air combat uh, gain advantage if they can do this faster than their adversary, uh, soldiers on the ground, generals on the ground. If they have better intelligence, if they get it faster, can evaluate it faster, act faster, they get inside the loop of their adversary and they win, even if they don't have equal forces. So when we overlay this, sorry, overlay this construct on the kill chain, what we have is um, a very strong pressure to remove human involvement from the engagement step. In the time that it takes uh, a question to go up the command chain, in the time it takes for the responsible decision maker to weigh the alternatives, an adversary ro robotic system could already have killed uh, or struck. So the competitive dynamics of uh, modern warfare will exert a steady pressure to push humans out of the decision-making loop. And uh, weapons makers will say, well, our AI is so sophisticated, it has a 0.001 error rate in making a 
an engagement decision, which is better than your soldiers. And this is a very dangerous threshold to cross. Here's a picture of the defendants at the Nuremberg trials. And um, when they were convicted, a very important precedent was set that, that uh, decision makers would be held responsible for crimes against humanity. But what happens when the decision is made by a machine? Uh, can we execute the machine? Can we uh, disassemble it? Uh, uh, is it the local commander who uh, deployed the weapon? Is it the, the personnel who activated it? Is it the company that made the weapon, the designer of the software? Who is responsible for uh, a bunch of civilians being mowed down uh, in a village somewhere? So this is, is the, the difficult ethical question is, is what was posed. And it's easy to imagine situations where the machine has uh, a very difficult decision human shield situations, combatants mingled with civilians. So much warfare today is asymmetric with irregulars uh, hiding uh, in uh, populated areas. Uh, this is a constant issue. And uh, US troops have been uh, convicted uh, and uh, sent to prison because of indiscriminate attacks on civilians in the Mideast. Uh, also, a robot army is ideal for repression of civilians. If it's programmed to kill anything it's aimed at, uh, the dictator du jour can unleash this on uh, protesters or uh, rebels uh, and uh, with no fear of uh, uh, disloyalty on the part of troops. Uh, the tipping point in several recent um, revolutions has been the refusal of troops to fire on their own people. Um, it happened in East Germany and in Iran. A robot army will not question its orders. And then lastly, you have the possibility of misidentification. Software is not good enough and it ends up killing the friendlies. So uh, these are all questions that uh, need to be addressed, but the development of these weapons is racing ahead. There's a little known uh, episode in the, the My Lai Massacre in 1968, a US helicopter pilot put a stop to the killings by landing after he'd seen that a massacre was underway. And uh, he told the US troops to stop shooting or that uh, his crew would open from his helicopter would open fire on them. And he probably saved uh, dozens if not hundreds of lives. But when we have killing machines deployed, who is going to stop them? There'll be no moral uh, uh, appeal unless uh, there is some way to regulate this uh, technology. So what is the resulting arms control challenge? How can humans be kept in the loop? How can escalation be prevented? How can non-combatants be protected? And uh, how can we stop another arms race? And also, how can we figure out what these systems are, are doing? How can we verify them? I'll now turn to the third area of high-tech weaponry. And uh, this is the most complex uh, thing I'm going to cover. So uh, bear with me. There's a fair amount of detail. Cyber weapons don't, unlike the ones we described before, have a physical manifestation. They're pure software. They're software designed to be destructive, to be inserted into uh, enemy or adversary computer systems to, uh, in a mild case, gather information, but in a destructive case to uh, degrade or completely destroy their uh, infrastructure. And the problem is they can be uh, uh, used to attack not just military systems, but all kinds of civilian infrastructure. The reason uh, these types of weapons can be made is that their targets uh, are vulnerable and uh, there is a powerful incentive of malfactors to take uh, software vulnerabilities and sell them to uh, 
organizations, criminal organizations, government organizations, as tools to uh, enable software attacks. This is a picture of the NSA, their shiny headquarters. You can be sure they're a well-funded organization. And uh, they develop and acquire what are called zero-day exploits. These are vulnerabilities in widely deployed software that not even the vendor knows about. And uh, this is what allows them to attack uh, and um, damage foreign systems. But of course, criminals can use the same methods uh, to extract uh, ransoms. And uh, another aspect of this stuff is if you design it to spread through an entire computer network, it can overflow um, the confines of a target institution and spread more generally, uh, unintentionally. I won't go through all the stages, but basically there's an initial breach of security, a destructive payload enters, and then it uh, it does its work and uh, tries to spread. Some of you may remember uh, the US and Israel trumpeting their achievement in destroying a lot of uh, uranium centrifuges in Iran in uh, 2009. Uh, this was a classic uh, case of using uh, just software. No bombs were dropped, no spies blew up anything. Uh, it was software that was cleverly introduced and uh, caused these uranium enrichment centrifuges to, to spin so fast that they destroyed themselves. Meanwhile, the people in the control room were getting false readings that everything was okay. But uh, more recently, a software attack crippled uh, uh, petroleum product distribution in uh, the Southeast. Some criminals uh, scrambled all the data of the Colonial Pipeline Company and demanded several million dollars in ransom. So uh, it, this could have been a nation state that uh, did something similar. It's the same type of uh, weaponry, just uh, uh, in the hands of criminals instead of uh, the military. Civilian infrastructure is highly vulnerable to cyber attack. It's obvious uh, when you go almost anywhere, if it's a, a bank or a grocery store or a hospital, uh, that computers are crucial to their operations. So if you, if you damage these networks, you inflict the harm on, on the civilian population. These are some numbers on how many targets we have potentially in the US for cyber attacks. And uh, if you develop a, a an arms race of cyber weaponry, you're pretty much inviting this, this type of attack at some point. So uh, here are the dangers that uh, we see. The weapons can be leaked or stolen. You can have accidental propagation of malware. You can have uh, propaganda impacts. The Russians, for example, are constantly accused of attacking the United States. But if you look more closely at the claim, it's uh, criminals in Russia. Now, whether that translates to the act of a nation state, it's an open question. The damage can be unpredictable and uh, escalation is possible because our good old strategy of deterrence is now in play regarding cyber attacks. President Biden has threatened Russia with uh, revenge attacks in the event that they uh, uh, create a serious uh, launch a serious attack on US commercial infrastructure. We'll see how well that works. Software weapons have been stolen from the NSA. The problem with securing software weapons is that they're so easy to steal. Now, you don't need a truck to steal a software weapon. All you need is a memory stick and access to the files. Uh, Edward Snowden took a, a huge amount of information from the NSA Fortunately, uh, not for malevolent purposes, but to this day, the NSA and CIA don't know how much he took. So the notion that we can safeguard this type of weaponry is illusory. There's a danger of misattribution. Uh, the CIA is on record as saying that they are, are happy with falsifying uh, events in service to our nation. Uh, 
the recent disclosure by WikiLeaks of what was called Vault 7 documents indicated that there is an entire set of tools called the Marble Framework, which is designed just to leave um, misleading fingerprints, uh, text in Farsi or uh, Russian or Chinese in the code so that people will think if somebody did it other than uh, the US. So uh, if you want a false flag incident, this is just a, a perfect tool. And again, the escalation risk. In the 2018 nuclear posture review, uh, it was slipped in that uh, it's not just a nuclear threat that would justify retaliation. It includes um, attacks in cyberspace potentially. So uh, the reason the doomsday clock is getting so close to midnight is there are more and more things that can put us on the escalation ladder. And we all know where that ladder ends. The US has established a cyber command. That's kind of like the Space Command. We're officially declaring uh, we're open for uh, militarization of this domain. Have the vendors line up. Don't worry, uh, you can trust us. And uh, in their uh, mission statement, it includes preparing tools for cyberspace attacks. So there's, you know, they're not uh, making any bones about it. This is part of their plan. Biden is not doing anything of consequence. Uh, he's slightly increased the, uh, the budget for Cyber Command, and he's talking about deterrence, tried and true deterrence. There's no, there are no negotiations underway. There was some talk in Geneva about needing uh, to begin to talk about uh, controlling arms threats, but there's no process underway. And all this activity is concealed from the public behind a wall of classified uh, uh, restrictions. I won't go into the details on these cyber attacks, but uh, it's interesting that half of them are criminal and, and half are by nation states. So what does that tell you? And there's no technological solution. To whatever vendors tell you, you can't bulletproof uh, software and uh, computer networks. There'll always be a way to break in. So here's the arms controls challenge. How can we keep human control in the loop? control escalation, protect civilian infrastructure and civilians, prevent arms racing, and how can we verify any kind of controls? So if you look at these emerging weapons, it's sort of a perfect secret storm. The US thinks it is going to be uh, superior in every weapons domain, wants to pursue that with big budgets. There's a popular culture that keeps uh, persuading people that the US is the master of technology. Classified programs hide all of this stuff. And there's almost no uh, arms control restraint of all this activity. So why are we ignoring all these things? There are perverse incentives I mentioned earlier. Doctrinal dogmas, the US military keeps talking about full spectrum dominance an illusory goal, and what I call fantasy wars. There are these uh, intermediate levels of conflict, like fighting uh, naval engagements in the Pacific with China. Uh, that's as realistic as the charge of the light brigade. The notion that uh, there'd be a gentleman's agreement, neither party would resort to nuclear weapons or massive uh, uh, counter strikes. Uh, that's just a fantasy from my point of view. And then lastly, public indifference, high-tech myths, trusting the experts, and it's really all too complicated to think about. So let's just uh, change the channel. All this means we need new directions for arms control and my colleague Ryan will uh, uh, undertake that explanation in the remainder of our presentation. So this would be a good time, I know it's been hard sitting through all this. So uh, those of you who have questions in the chat, we would like to address them now. So if uh, there are currently no questions in the chat. Uh, if anybody does have a question, please unmute and you can ask it. Sure. Uh, 
or type it in the chat if you wish. Could I ask uh, a bit of a historical question? Um, you mentioned the Space Force, but it was my understanding that there was a both a quantitative and qualitative uh, increase in, in funding and research under the Obama administration. So it didn't uh, begin with Trump. Is is that correct? I think you're right, but. Uh... These programs have a momentum that carries them right through administrations. And exactly. Yeah, that's my point. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, weapons are popular um, and uh, they're well supported. The lobbyists of the defense uh, industries are uh, uh, very efficient in uh, uh, getting their uh, projects approved. The F-35, which is the most expensive aircraft program ever developed for the Air Force, has been uh, saddled with uh, problems from day one. And recently, a bunch of Democratic House members formed uh, a caucus to demand that more F-35s be built. So uh, once one of these programs gets rolling, it's effectively unkillable. And once the Space Force starts getting its killer satellites and whatnot approved, uh, it's going to be very hard to get the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, and briefly, Mr. Balderston, to your point about these projects transgressing administrations, plenty of nefarious projects began under the Obama administration. For instance, the trillion plus dollar renovation of the nuclear arsenal, the pivot to the so called pivot to Asia. Uh, bringing China fully into the into the fold as a primary adversary, um, of course, projects to uh, engage in color revolutions on the Russian border, Ukraine, for instance, all projects that have really contributed to current tensions that we're seeing now that are intensifying this high tech arms race began under the Obama administration, carried right through Trump and as we predict, will carry right through the Biden administration. Charles? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Charles. Go ahead if you have a question. Um, no, I didn't have a question, sorry. Oh. Okay, it's still empty, so we're all set. We can move on. Thank you, folks. Okay, then moving on. I want to ensure we have ample time for question and answers at the end of our presentation. So I'm going to go through these first couple of slides very briefly. But essentially, Ike has set forth a huge and, and dangerous problem facing us currently. The various directions this high-tech arms race could take um, seem to all lead in scary, dangerous directions. So the question becomes, what do we do? What do we do about this? And what can the Green Party as a political force outside the blob, so to speak, the military industrial complex, which is largely driving these developments in the United States, at least, what can it do to just start to mobilize and, and hopefully erode that public indifference that I referenced. So the first question we asked in thinking about what can we do about this current problem is to look at what have we done in the past? How have we gone about trying to regulate dangerous weapon systems in the past. So with that, I'm going to briefly undertake a survey of arms control history. And to that end, I think it might be good time-wise if we just advance to slide 61, and I'll just go through the, the recap. Perfect. OK. so. The, the hieroglyphics, essentially, you see on this slide are a recapitulation of the phases of arms control going back to 
roughly the 1850s, where the origin of, of modern arms control lies with the creation of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And what the ICRC did and, and the movement that was behind it did was to attempt to inject humanitarian principles into the regulation of conflict. As war became more and more destructive with the development and cultivation of new weapon systems in the Industrial Revolution, there became increasing opportunities, unfortunately, for civilians to be caught up in conflicts. So the ICRC went about trying to introduce and, and codify some basic humanitarian protections to constrain unbridled war fighting. And that led to some important early conventions, the St. Petersburg Convention and the early Hague Conventions, which placed restrictions on both what armed combatants could do vis-a-vis -vis civilians, and also in restricting certain types of weapon systems that had the propensity to result in indiscriminate damage and to maim soldiers as opposed to, to killing them. So this framework was entirely, like much of international law at the time, consent-based, entirely consent-based. States could either say we, we consent and we'll comply or we won't comply. And most did, but the lure, the allure of, of force and elite uh, disseminated nationalism led to a catastrophic failure of this system in the Great War and World War I, after which time, so this, this first bullet point, humanitarian focused consent-based represents the period leading up to World War I. After World War I, there were some important recognitions. There was um, not a period of, of public indifference like we see today. There was much um, opposition to war in the aftermath of all of the terrible destruction in Europe. And arms control and the idea of constraining war led leaders to think rule of law could be perhaps an alternative framework to brute force. And this was implemented and structured the League of Nations framework, which incorporated in a more law-driven way these humanitarian principles and also recognized that pure consent alone was not sufficient. And this was the, the to um, enforce these principles more effectively the notion of collective security, the CS here in the slide, was codified in the famous Articles 10 and 11 of the, of the Charter of the League of Nations. Unfortunately, during this period, I should note some ambitious arms control initiatives were undertaken, including the famous Kellogg-Briand Pact, which is referenced in the Green Party platform, which made the idea of offensive wars or the act of starting offensive wars illegal, and also the Washington Naval Treaty, which is attempted to restrict and hedge the uh, burgeoning new renewed arms race in the dreadnought battleship context, and the World Disarmament Conference, uh, which attempted to undertake massive it was a hugely ambitious agenda to undertake massive restrictions on, on armaments. All of this failed again for the same reasons, essentially the, the pre-World War I agenda failed. Leaders had sufficient power uh, to undercut these initiatives and were drawn to the, the old uh, age old innate uh, principle of rule of, of, of rule of force over rule of law facilitated by, again, top-down nationalism. We have World War II, again, catastrophic war resulting in massive casualties and massive destruction. And that leads to the League of, that leads to the current United Nations framework, which was set up and established formally in 1946. And this, again, takes a, a more general interest focused approach 
but is very much power driven. The United States emerges from World War II as an unparalleled global hegemon, the Soviet Union being the, the, the distant second, and effectively the power of those power concentration in those two entities made any type of genuine efforts toward multilateralism effectively impossible. And that leads to the one, the, the bullet point that's highlighted in yellow now, which is quickly where arms control, the direction arms control quickly took, which was a national interest focused again, return to consent base because global hegemons couldn't be compelled to do anything they didn't want to do. Bilateral framework, and this is where we see arms control that really didn't take shape until the late 1960s, 1970s um, between the Soviet Union and the United States where both sides went about negotiating how to minimally constrain their weapon systems in such a manner that effectively advanced their national interests with no regard for common interests, as was the case in the, the interwar period and pre-World War I period phases of arms control where humanitarian principles reigned supreme. There's been a brief, there've been some efforts to revitalize this multilateral approach with the uh, cluster munitions ban, the ban on uh, uh, anti-personnel landmines, and most recently and promisingly the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. But those remain uh, entirely subordinate to uh, major power um, whims. Next slide, please. So what observations can we make from looking looking back at the past to see what's been done and are there any lessons to be learned and the answer is yes i think there are some important takeaways and i've artic i've taken those those takeaways and essentially composed or distilled them to three main points and the first is that looking back what do we see what are the continuities one is that the security policy formation process has been a domain of elites. It has been, the security policy has been and continues to be formulated by elites, very oftentimes behind closed doors, doors closed to the public on the basis of classified information to which the public has no uh, recourse. And justifications for these decisions are are offered in Latin to an entirely vernacular speaking public, so to speak. Uh, this cartoon, which I love, captures this. Essentially, you have the common people of the world depicted as sheep, and you've got the few elite leaders making the decisions up on stage, and they're wolves, crocodiles, and tigers. And accordingly, when you have wolves, crocodiles, and tigers formulating your security policy, the global security environment has been a, an aggressive for, rule of force based uh, environment. So the second is that the frameworks that have resulted from the, the arms control frameworks that is that have resulted from these leaders have been characterized by the same essentially recurring cooperation problems, albeit in different contexts. But those cooperation problems are Primarily the prisoner's dilemma problem, which is the incentive to cheat and the uh, prioritization of unilateral gain over positive sum gain. Um, the second is uncertainty problems. When you have uh, national entities or the leaders of national entities presiding over highly classified information, pursuing and undertaking weapons programs in a highly classified, oftentimes minimally, if not entirely unregulated capacity manner, you have uncertainty problems. And uncertainty problems breed mistrust, and mistrust in turn fuels arms racing and is very oftentimes used by leaders as as a pretext for arms racing. We don't know what China's doing. We need to develop this system too before they do. Next slide, please. And then the final observation I think is an incredibly important one to which I eluded. Essentially, I'm just um, codifying what he was saying. And that is 
We look, looking back at the history of arms racing and the history of arms control, we see an inability or unwillingness to learn from the past. So looking at the nuclear era, um, we saw that the, the impulse was to arms race in the nuclear context. When that reached its end, the, either the credibility problem or omnicide, we then shifted to downgrade. Instead of abandoning militarism, we embraced what I call downgraded militarism. Okay, we can't, arm, we can't fight and credibly threaten nuclear weapons use anymore, so let's move to conventional weapons. Once that reached its end, which we, Haig and I suggest is happening essentially now, um, again, we continue to embrace militarism now in the, the gray zone and the high tech sphere. So in these instances, we see these decisions leading to the same results, which are essentially gratuitous risk increases, massive economic waste, all without clear offsetting strategic advantages. When one side develops a certain weapon that affords some type of strategic advantage, the other side quickly counters with either a comparable capability or some capability that nullifies that capability. And the end result is increased danger for everybody, not strategic advantage for one side over the other. So I think Mr. Einstein's quote is readily applicable and should be um, read and seriously contemplated by the leaders making these decisions. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. Next slide, please. So what are we doing now? As Ike suggested, very little. The arms control frameworks that resulted from the, the bilateral major power context are in the process of active decay. The anti-ballistic missile treaty has collapsed. The intermediate range nuclear forces treaty has collapsed. The open skies treaty has collapsed. New start was extended. The new strategic arms reduction treaty was extended by the Obama administration with Mr. Putin's government, but only for five years and any type of follow on treaty seems uh, quite unlikely at this point. Also, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the one multilateral treaty regulating the, the, the nuclear sphere is in the process of, of active disintegration. And um, there's no follow on or replacement treaty to that as long as the uh, leaders of the major powers continue to unequivocally reject the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. As Hayek also mentioned, there are no frameworks governing high-tech weapons currently. It's the Wild West. It's a, it's a free-for-all. Uh, there have been, the Tallinn Manual was an effort by um, academics to and, and legal scholars to come together to try and articulate, well, uh, what, how to fit high-tech weapons into existing laws of war, but there's, there's no arms control component therein. Uh, the German initiative here, this picture features the German for, current German foreign minister, Mr. Heiko Maas. He has convened two now um, international conferences on current technology and how it could be regulated in the weapons sphere. But so far, all that's really emerged from those conferences has been, we need to do something, not what are we actually going to do? Um, there has been an effort in the I, in the NGO, the non-governmental organization sphere, the Human Rights Watch, and the um, and the um, international campaign to ban killer robots have advanced the idea of a ban on fully autonomous weapon systems. That's gaining some traction, but again. Nothing, nothing uh, significant. Certainly, at the at the the level of major powers contemplating it. So what we do see is major within the the major powers status quo elite ranks is a 
voracious appetite for competition and new arms racing and no appetite really or no little to no appetite for arms control what we see is a new cold war taking taking hold with china very much in the the mix this time next slide please so as ike suggested in his slides there are a lot of the new weapon systems, new generations of high-tech weapons pose significant challenges for arms racing, or for arms control rather, uh, where arms control has historically been a slow lumbering process um, involving constraining weapons that develop comparatively slowly over time. Today, weapon systems are, are mainly, or the hardware of weapon systems are simply shells for software that can be input at any can be input readily so the analogy here is a virus where um, weapon systems or where the virus namely weapon systems used to mutate once a year now they mutate constantly they're undergoing a constant stage of mutation and vaccine namely arms control is it's much more difficult for it to keep up so next slide please so what do we do? Our recommendations. How do we take all of this information and, and form this into a um, finite proposal? Well, in the abstract, what we need to do are what we need to do is tailor arms control to address both substantive and structural challenges. Substantive being the actual new weapon systems, structural being the the the, the process by which arms control and security policy is formed, which keeps leading us in the wrong direction. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Well, step one is to subsume high-tech weapons under an appropriate international legal framework. Hike referenced the Nuremberg principles, which were codified by the International Law Commission following the Nuremberg trials. We suggest those are the ideal international legal framework. Principle six, um, specifically um, uh, makes legally sanctionable the act of simply planning acts of wars of aggression and um, the development of um, systems that have the propensity to cause uh, mass and in indiscriminate damage, harm to civilians. High-tech weapons, for all the reasons Haig elaborated, um, have the propensity to cause these indiscriminate damages and the, the, precisely the kind of uh, result in the kinds of scenarios that the Nuremberg principles lend themselves nicely to regulating. So what could the Green Party platform do with this idea? Well, the Green Party platform already calls on the US government to respect international law. We su suggest the inclusion of specific reference calling on the, on the application of international law to high-tech weapons. Next slide, please. Okay, so step two, step one, subsume under international law. Step two is to create the arms control frame, specific arms control frameworks for these new weapons. And that is, that, that has multiple parts, three parts in particular that we highlight here. One is to speak to substance, to promulgate actual substantive restrictions, for instance, ban on fully autonomous attack, attack controls, to restrict the uh, development or possibly deployment, depending on how you want to define that, um, of mass and indiscriminate weapons technology like cyber, for instance, or cyber capabilities that are geared toward um, disabling civilian infrastructures. Uh, monitoring and compliance, how do we monitor this? How do we undermine that structural problem of lack of transparency or uncertainty. Well, we propose a software registration protocol, which would require weapons governments to provide the specific software specifications for their weapons to a supranational body, which could then monitor them and um, ensure that they're in compliance with the substantive restrictions. Next slide, please. Phase three, 
or part three speaks to the prisoner's dilemma problem, and that is to impose meaningful sanction or to have meaningful sanction mechanisms in place. We suggest criminal liability, and we suggest providing criminal liability in instances of weapons causing uh, resulting in war crimes, not just for military and political leaders, but also for manufacturers of these weapon systems. And we, I, I include here in the slides, consider possibly a doctrine of strict liability in instances where significant civilian harm results from, from weapons use. And then endow the either the International Criminal Court or some new enforcement body with robust competencies and capabilities for investigating and prosecuting uh, criminals or perpetrators, users of these weapons and the manufacturers of these weapons in instances of uh, war crime or crimes against humanity. Next slide, please. Okay, so how to actually make that happen. So we've, we've looked at um, what to do, how to do it, but now how to make it happen. And here, this is a very difficult question, but here we suggest democratization of the security process. The, these, the, the decision-making for these all important decisions has to be taken out of the hands of this elite group uh, acting in interests that are incompatible with the common interest. And we suggest possible large-scale declassification campaign um, among other, other mechanisms. And here we feel the Green Party platform should specifically call for democratization in the national security policy process. Next slide. So this arms race is bad news, but the good news is that these same technologies that are being used to create these very dangerous weapon systems can also be used to refashion arms control which is desperately needed. So with that, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, do, do we have any questions from, from anyone? Please uh, use the chat or unmute and ask us uh, directly. Um, I, I've got one myself. Um, uh, Hike, you mentioned those three categories of, of weapons. Uh, and it did seem to me that the, the one was totally unregulated. Uh, I think Ryan might have used the term a wild, wild west. Um, would that be the appropriate uh, point at which to approach this? Or is there some other avenue, some other, what that is, what would be the I know they're not quick and easy, but the immediate next step that we might approach this rather large problem. Well, Lou, I think um, um, the cyber weaponry is very prominent in public consciousness now. Uh, and I think everyone can understand how disruptive uh, a successful cyber attack would be, or if you call it successful. Uh, on their lives. So I think that's probably the, uh, the button to push in terms of raising consciousness of, of these issues. Um, the other weaponry is, is a little farther away, but uh, uh, this uh, 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 pipeline fiasco uh, where you know, people were lining up for gas uh, gave people a taste of, of the consequences of, of an unregulated uh, um, environment. And uh, I think even Biden um, came out of uh, the Geneva discussion uh, with a very feeble step, uh, basically uh, telling uh, Putin that here's a list of things that shouldn't be attacked in the United States. And that's hardly an arms control framework, but uh, it shows that uh, the leaders of these major countries are beginning to grasp that this is uh, a Pandora's box that's been opened. So I think that's probably the, the easiest avenue to approach this right now, the, uh, the cyber weapons threat. Thank you. Uh, Charles, 
Please go ahead, Charles. Um, there's several interesting proposals for uh, Green Party platform, and I'm wondering if you have um, either existing language or groups that are working on these frameworks that we could point to or steal language from and drafting some amendments. Uh, funny you should ask. <laughs> GPAX has on its uh, task list the uh, development of specific uh, amendments to the platform. And uh, uh, we've, we've had um, uh, a major document submitted to us by a, a green uh, member from New York, which is much more detailed than the current platform. And uh, what we have to do is, is break it up into specific amendments. So there's a lot of work, but we're hoping over the next month or so to be able to submit some platform revisions. The deadline I think is sometime in September. So yes, we're aware of that opportunity and we are working on it. I guess I'm also asking if there's any language that's been vetted or developed by groups of professionals that we could look at or refer to. Well, uh, the problem is most of the professionals are on the payroll of the defense establishment. Uh, there are a bunch of NGOs that have made some tentative uh, statements, but what we're looking at is a, a more rigorous kind of uh, approach. And uh, Ryan has outlined some, some new directions that are, um, I think, quite promising, but will take uh, months and years to get into mainstream uh, uh, circles. But yeah, to, to answer, to, to offer one specific instance, I think the Human Rights Watch and the Killer Robots campaign have do have some specific language with regard to a ban on fully autonomous weapon systems. And that's language we could look at and, and draw from. Uh, there's nothing in the chat. Does anybody else have a question for our our presenters? I've got a question for you, Lou. Uh, when will uh, the uh, the recording of um, of this workshop be available? Do you think? Um, what what they're doing is they're taking the Zoom recordings and they're going to uh, download pl place them somewhere so that they'll be available publicly. Um, I'm not sure how long that would take. Uh, it may be a couple of days, it may be uh, three to five days, but uh, I think they've got a process set up to get those up and available as soon as possible. Um, last call for any questions or comments from either the those in attendance or our presenters. Uh, one more comment, Lou. Um, if people are interested in progress being made on this platform uh, issue, they can check in on the uh, GPACS committee website because we will be posting uh, notices on uh, how that's coming along. Very good, thank you, thank you. Um, let me uh, thank uh, Hike and, and Ryan for a very comprehensive uh, presentation covering a lot of bases but putting it together uh, quite nicely. I think I think this uh, recording will be quite valuable moving forward. I also want to thank the attendees uh, for their participation, for the questions offered. Um, just a second, I see something in the chat here. Uh, I think that was a link to the GPAX website, which is gpax.gpus.org, and an aloha from uh, from from Nikki in Hawaii. So. Uh, with that, I'll say good goodbye, and uh, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the annual national meeting. Take care, folks. Thanks, all. Thanks. Thank you.